I've always had a very prominent uh, component of my work be media criticism. Mm -hmm. Obviously, appearing more on Fox than MSNBC and CNN is something that's new. But I think that's because the views that I've always espoused, the kind of values I've always embraced, are heard more on Fox and than than CNN and MSNBC, where they're not welcome. That is kind of amazing, though, right? Because you know, 15 years ago, the you know, Fox News was the national security network and CNN was a critic, or MSNBC in particular. What what has changed that? Is it is it simply the fact of, you know, before and after Donald Trump or that Republicans are out of power, so, you know, or partly out of power, so they want to attack the government and liberals or progressives are in power, so they want to protect the government? I actually think the primary impetus originally was the reliance on Russiagate as mm -hmm. the principal theme of the Hillary Clinton campaign. Once you start positing that there's some evil foreign villain bent upon wrecking havoc inside the United States and that the political opponent domestically is aligned with that foreign mm -hmm. power, that's a already kind of very jingoistic way of looking at the world. Mm -hmm. You stimulate fear of and, and hatred toward a foreign enemy, and suddenly you want to be protected from that foreign yeah. enemy. On top of which, Russiagate itself emanated from the bowels of the CIA, the mm -hmm. bowels of the U.S. security state, which was feeding leaks to the Washington Post and the New York Times. Mm -hmm. And liberals began viewing those security state agencies, the hatred of which has always been fundamental mm -hmm. to left-wing politics for decades, as not just their allies, but these kind of guardians of yep. all that was good and decent in the world. And that began this radical transformation about these kinds of questions. <laughs> it's really creepy. And as you say, it's it's kind of alien to the news mission, theoretically. Theoretically, we don't care, um, you know, whether whether or not he has um, what the what the political import of him, you know, possibly having a cognition issue would be i think what happened during the campaign and i know this because i talked to some of the people who were covering him i followed him for a little while um you know they a lot of us saw him in 2008 we saw the clear difference uh, as you say he was he was quick uh he uh, always seemed prescient although he did sometimes have trouble speaking um sometimes he would kind of accelerate unnecessarily or mm -hmm. his uh, his emotional tenor would be sometimes not match the speech, like uh, it, it, the register would be angry when it was supposed to be inspiring, it would be off yeah. somehow. Um, but in 2020, it was a completely different issue. Uh, it clearly had to do with, you know, things like not being aware of where he was, being unable to control impulses like anger with people, um, you know, forgetting where he was in the middle of a sentence. It wasn't a speech issue, uh, although that, I'm sure that complicated it, right? Um, but I think what a lot of the reporters are saying to the, each, each other was, well, if we talk about this, then it's going to hurt his chances against, against Trump. And part of our mission now is to make sure that Trump doesn't win. So let's sit on this. But what ended up happening, you know, I think that ends up becoming a, a problem of credibility for the newspaper, uh, which makes it more difficult to report on things and have an impact on the public uh, overall. <laughs> if you look, for example, at what the Clintonian project was in the early 1990s, it was to take the Democratic Party out of the hands of the left and to put the power in the hands of corporatists mm -hmm. and centrists and the kinds of people who are status quo guardians of, of ruling class orthodoxy. But then Hillary Clinton herself, and I think people didn't realize this at the time, including me, that there was a lot more dissent about foreign policy taking place inside the, Clinton, the Obama administration than was widely known. Obama himself was somebody who ironically if anybody should be accused of being soft on Putin or mm -hmm. trying to appease the Kremlin, it was he. Yeah. A primary line of attack on him was that he was too soft when it came to confronting Russia. That was yeah. the famous Mitt Romney line in, in 2012. Yep. Rubio and, and John McCain and Lindsey Graham, the kind of militarists in the Republican mm -hmm. Party, constantly attacked him on that ground. The main specifics were his refusal to arm the Ukrainians based mm -hmm. on his view that Ukraine was never going to be a vital interest to the U.S., but always would be to Russia. His refusal to confront uh, the Russians in Syria and, and overthrowing Bashar al-Assad and kind of constraining the CIA. And his biggest critic inside the, the Obama administration, 
insisting that Russia was a far greater threat than Obama was recognizing was Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. So she was already prone to this hardline interventionism, militarism, already looking at Russia as this grave and central mm -hmm. threat that was her primary split with Obama. And so when this opportunity presented itself to tie Trump to Russia, mm -hmm. of course, part of it was opportunistic, but I think part of it grew out of mm -hmm. her actual worldview. <laughs>
even more than it's already divided. Well, what's your answer to that? Because you know, is whose interest is that serving? What's I do. I, I really. I, I don't. I don't mean this in a very conspiratorial sense. I think that the way power functions is, you know, I believe in power. We right. talk about power. Mm -hmm. I don't think everyone believes in power, though. But the way what power means is, ideologies thrive to the extent that it serves people mm -hmm. in power. They right. they they foster those ideologies that advance their interest in balkanizing and dividing people by race and keeping mm -hmm. them kind of blaming one another is a way of keeping attention off, off rolling across the league. <laughs>Has the left become the salespeople for the military industrial complex? Yeah, I think that's the thesis that that uh, I'm sort of playing around with here is this idea that, you know, after the neoconservative project fizzled out, right, the Iraq war turns out to be a fiasco. Uh, the nation building project turns out to be a fiasco. It costs not only Bush and the Republicans, but Hillary Clinton, um, you know, the, the election in 2008. Um, so the military industrial complex, I think, needed to rebrand itself. It, it faced for the first time in a long time cuts in 2011. And I think what, what you've seen since then, uh, since the middle Obama years, is the steady rebrand of what the military is for. Uh, our interventions have more and more overtly been framed as humanitarian in nature or designed to um, overturn regressive political actors, whether it's uh, you know, Assad or Gaddafi or even a warlord like Joseph Kony um, or the Taliban, you know, because, because they uh, squelch women's rights. So they've pretty seamlessly taken a lot of the same themes that were hammered by people like Ari Fleischer and Dick Cheney and Bush and David Frum. And they've just kind of shifted the language a little bit to say things like, well, we can't normalize Assad and basically you have the Bushian doctrine of you know needing needing to end tyranny around the world uh but it's rewritten as a, as a new kind of progressive project and I think they've been very successful at that uh which has been reflected in obviously in these massive budget hikes uh under Biden uh, which are just historic but you're right. I'm, I'm also I'm also old enough to remember <laughs> that being anti-war at one point was like it was like a required element of being on the left. And uh, now I, I think it's very far. It, seems, it feels like it's very far down the list of concerns to me. I don't know. <laughs> I think if you look at the kinds of people who are tolerated and the kinds of people who are demonized mm -hmm. widely. I think what you'll I think in that question is a very interesting revelation. It's the people who are demonized are obviously the people that sort of the system, for lack of a better term, regard just threatening. When is the last time you heard anyone really complaining about, let's say, Sean Hannity? Mm -hmm. like, almost never. He's like he performs his role. I actually forgotten that he exists. Exactly, because no one talks yeah. about him. It's not yeah. because no one's mm -hmm. watching his show. He says this. Right. You know, he's number he's four or five. Yeah, 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 he makes a ton of money on on yeah. talk radio. He's doesn't. He's a big audience. Right. But he's very unthreatening because he's just like a partisan. He's mm -hmm. a Republican Party loyalist. You know what he's going to say. He's out there preaching the same, you know, mm -hmm. established. He, 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 whatever comes out of Mitch McConnell's mouth comes out of Sean Hannity's right. mouth. Like, there's no division. Whereas Tucker Carlson, to a lesser extent, yeah. Laura Ingram, are people who are widely despised because they're actually doing something a little bit more subversive. I think that if you look, if you even, and it happens both on the right and the left, mm -hmm. you know, when, when Bernie looked like he might actually get yeah. the nomination in 2016, it was all, <laughs> you know, out to make sure he didn't. Right. Um, the same in Ron 2020. Paul, uh, had a, I mean, it was, he was never as big a threat as He became Bur a Bernie threat, Paul. like in 2012, he yeah. was going into Iowa and, and South Carolina yeah. and say, why are we, you know, why do we have 600 military bases yeah. around the world? And why oh, are we I'm saying, people... I just, he, he didn't get as far along. No, he was really yeah, demonized. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I remember the one time I wrote a yeah. positive article about Ron Paul. It was one of the most, you yeah. know, damaging things I, I inflicted yeah. on myself within left liberal politics. And, or, you know, you look at people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and, and Matt Gates, Like, the people who are dissidents to establishment orthodoxy mm -hmm. for good or for bad right. are the people who become the most threatening and therefore the most attacked and the most demonized. <laughs>
do you ever get discouraged and just think, what the hell? The things aren't getting any better. This is bullshit. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I would say I, I'm, I'm a little nervous now in ways that I've never really been before. Like I, I lived in the post-Soviet um, universe. So I saw what happens when a massive industrial uh, superpower collapses. Like I was there for that, watching it happen. I remember this day when they, uh, they devalued the ruble. So mm. people who had been holding their money in their uh, mattresses, they're saving up their whole lives. And suddenly like in, in, a, in a snap, it was worthless. People just stumbled onto the street and they were just dazed, you know, um, yeah. and, and America, there are, it is fraying at the edges in ways that make you worry about that kind of scenario, right? You know, I think the, frankly, as much as I think some of the Trump coverage is overblown, I, is this whole idea of, um, you know, tests of our democracy that there's, there's a real element to that. I, I, I am nervous about it. I think people are, um, ready to throw down in civil conflict in ways they've never been uh, willing to do before, which really makes me, I don't know, how do you feel about it? Because I, I, I'm, I'm more pessimistic now about that kind of stuff than I ever have been. I'm more pessimistic than I've ever been. And I was in the fringes of empire when that happened in Hungary and Poland. And I saw people just you know, assembling private armies and, you know, the gas station on the corner in my girlfriend's neighborhood, all of a sudden it's taken over by thugs. And it's like, this is ours now. And the factory where she worked, okay, they, these guys are taking it now. And it's just like, okay. And they're oligarchs and they're running things. now. Okay. I can see something like that happening for sure. So uh, I'm kind of worried, but, you know, I always quote Antonio Gramsci, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. But I, I tend to think we're in for a potentially a rocky ride for a while. Yeah. And Americans are, are, I mean, other countries have a tradition where they've dealt with stuff like that before, upheaval, uh, displacement, you know, things not working. Uh, infrastructure collapsing, like that's a thing that other countries have histories of. We we don't, maybe the depression is probably the closest thing we've had to just sort of a total collapse. But uh, as you say, the, the kind of things that you're describing, I mean, I remember seeing somebody just basically putting a, uh, um, uh, like a, a blockade across a highway in the, the um, uh in in one in one of the siberian regions because he just created his own toll booth uh you know because if you, <laughs> if you have if you have your own gun you know and you're in the middle of nowhere like you know what what are people gonna do and that's that's the kind of stuff that people in this country just don't they have no idea how bad it can get um and i worry about that too just to be, just because america has always been such a stable place yeah. um compared to everywhere else in the world and I think people either pull together at that point or they turn on each other. And we we don't have any tradition of that. So I don't know which we'll do. But, you know, I had to get out of Hungary. I was actually they said, get out. And I said, well, I have a ticket on Saturday. There's no tonight. And uh, well, we have no place to go because we're Americans. So, you know, we shall see. Yeah. Scary. Yeah, yep. we'll, we will see. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.